Okay, so I brought it up slowly on the Variac, and uh, this is after cleaning all of the contacts, working on the grounds, pulling all the tubes out and testing them and so on. We'll go through that. The big discovery with this radio was that it had this thing called a standby switch. So you really have to have the standby switch in the receive position before you hear anything. And I feel so much better hearing this hum because that means that the speaker's good, probably the output tube is good, probably the transformer's good. And does it respond to the volume control? It does. See, those are all good signs. Now, of course, with this hum, we know the capacitors probably need to be changed in the filter area of the radio. But So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come, come out of limiting. There we go. So yeah, the limiter is out now, counterclockwise. I'm hearing hiss. So I hooked it up to my 10 meter loop. That's a horizontal loop up about 30 feet. Let's try peaking. Hey, whoop. Oh, we just lost something. Hello? Yeah, you know, a little more work is needed. Maybe the relay contacts need a little more cleaning. But now I'm going to remove the antenna. Oh, yeah. So that tells me that tip to tail, the receiver is basically working. That's a really good sign. Next, I'm going to, with no crystal at all, I'm simply going to short out the PTT terminals and see if it goes into transmit. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll buy that. We're making progress. Let's see what I had to do to get this far with this. Lafayette transceiver. Now we have to get down to some serious troubleshooting. I'm going to start by pulling the tubes, testing all the tubes, of course, clean the relay contacts, clean all the controls, do an inspection underneath, see if we see any uh, crispy critters, so to speak. And now we'll start to do it more my way to try to bring this thing back. So here it is, the Lafayette six meter amateur band transceiver. Model HE45B, as in Bravo. So this guy uh, looks to be early 1960s technology. We've got uh, standard carbon composition half-watt resistors, a few 1 and 2-watt resistors showing. Condition looks good. All of those ceramic capacitors are likely okay. There are a few tubular paper capacitors that appear to be good quality. General Instruments capacitors, these are very nice caps, all of them uh, sealed type. But inside, I assure you, it's probably insulated paper, so on. Looks like there has been an attempt to do some work. We have two alien capacitors. Both of these are late model electrolytics that have been probably just paralleled in. I don't see any uh, cutting away of terminals from the main filter capacitor. That used to be a trick. You just simply parallel the failing capacitor with uh, fresh capacitors and usually you could get another five or ten years out of the unit reducing the hum and so on. But eventually the failing capacitors will become such low impedance that uh, circuits will s stop working. And I think that's what's happened here. So just looking at the bottom, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go crazy here. The next step will be flipping it over and pulling the tubes out, testing all the tubes. Then with all tubes removed, I'll do a closer inspection and start buzzing out the circuit 
to see if I can identify any uh, problems. And yes, the electrolytic capacitor, I'll be disconnecting the leads from that and attempting to do a recap job. I don't think I'm going to go as far as to try to get a replacement cap. The basic idea here is to retain the silver can capacitor for looks mostly, but it will be completely disconnected. All sections on that cap will be disconnected. I do have a schematic diagram. It's in pretty good shape. I can read this. Now I'm looking at the capacitor over here. It looks like it's four 40 microfarad sections. Uh, yeah, they're all part of that capacitor. Not sure if this capacitor that's on the audio modulator output tube is part of that, but we'll find out. Okay, let's uh, let's get the tubes out. Let's see what we're uh, up against. Also, we're going to be uh, cleaning and lubricating all of the controls, and we're going to be loosening and tightening all of the hardware because grounding is a big issue with these older transceivers. They are depending on the chassis for ground. I see some soldering right straight to the chassis. That's a good practice, actually. I like that better than rivets. And of course, we have some IF transformers, so the dreaded silver mica leaching problem is uh, all part of the game. We'll see if uh, the IF cans are in good shape or not. So here we go. Let's take a look at the tubes next. Yes, uh, the capacitor that we're talking about is right here, and it is indeed a multiple cap that has four, three or four 40 mic sections, as well as the 10 microfarad bypass for the uh, modulator. So all in one right here, that's the capacitor we're going to be essentially replacing with individual electrolytic capacitors. This big tube here must be the modulator. Interesting looking tube, I wonder what that is. Because these are late model tubes, including uh, nine pins and this strange, uh, maybe it's a Novar, we will have to use the late model tube tester, not my precision tube tester, which is a generation older. It's really difficult to find one tester that can do everything. It's easier to buy two less expensive old type tester that does perhaps tubes from the 20s through the 40s, and then a late model tester that handles tubes from the 50s through, you know, the mid 60s when tubes started to uh, fade away. And that's what this tester is. This is a late model tester. Novar and Duo Decar and, and so on, uh, tubes that were put into televisions when they wanted to triple up sections to try to save money toward the end of the game. Solid state would come very quickly, and pretty soon the only tube in your television would be the picture tube. I'm going to uh, pull tubes and test as I go. That way I don't have to worry about tubes in and out. You know, normally I'd take them all out, put them in a wash tub, then test them, put them back in. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start with the top and start testing tubes. Go right down the right down the thing till I get to the end. We'll get that out of the way first. So this is the 12BA6 RF amplifier tube, and it's testing good. But I just want to show you that uh, it's worth going through these tubes. Most of the time, you're going to find that the tubes are fine. That's not the problem with a radio like this. It's more related to components uh, varying in value or shorting out, that kind of thing. And occasionally, it's something as simple as relay contacts. This thing does have a relay with two important contacts. I think it's a dual pull double throw, so it's uh, two sections of, uh, of relay. We'll get that taken care of. And what else we got in there? Oh, there's a vibrator unit. There's not much we can do with that. We're not operating this on DC, so I probably won't even test that. I'll be operating this set on AC. Chances are the contacts of the vibrator are either completely interoperable or oxidized anyway. So short of taking the vibrator all apart, there's not much I can do with that. So we're going to ignore that for now. Let's go on to the next tube. If I run into any trouble with tubes, I'll record that on the video. Okay, the 6CN8 turns out to be the noise limiter tube. And it looks like the noise limiter consists of two diodes and a triode. 
This is kind of an oddball tube. I've never seen one of these before. The triode section is just into the paint of being good. But you know what? I think it will work fine in the circuit. So I'm not going to be so alarmed that I'm going to order another tube. I'm going to call this one good enough and put it right back in the radio. Here's the IF tube. It's a 12AU6. It's plenty good. This uh, modulator tube is a 7868. So that's kind of a fancy tube and it's marked Lafayette. So let's see what we're going to do there. And it is in my book, 78, 68, 68, 1, 2, 6, 7, and 21. Okay, 1, 2, 6, 7. Okay, let's put this thing in. I think it will fit in here. Oh, look at that, huh? I think this is the one that had the sparks in it, too. I got to get the filament actually turned on. Oh, I think I do see it lighting. It is lighting up. It's taking a while. Come on off the pin. My God, it's moving. Come on. The little tube that could. It's into the question mark region. Okay, just in. There's no doubt that a modulator audio output tube operating in class A, cooking for, you know, 20 years, in this circuit would be the one that would take the most abuse, more abuse than the actual 2E26 final tube, in fact, because this class A stage is always operating. It always would have current going through it. So it's probably the most tired tube in the circuit. I'm going to let it go and pretend it's okay. I'm not gonna go as far to order one uh, no doubt this tube has taken a lot of abuse over the years, and it may be questionable as to whether it will work okay in the circuit. The other thing, we saw some sparking in Arkin, so the tube might have taken some damage. This was the, uh, the tube that had the internal blue flashes. So if there is a questionable tube, it's probably this one. So finally, let's do the 2E26 final. And the 2E26 is testing good. I'm using the 6146 settings in the book because 2E26 is not listed. He's never told me about this thing called a standby switch. Now, I've uh, cleaned all the contacts, the relay contacts. I made sure all the tube sockets look good, wiggled all the tubes, tested all the tubes, and I slowly brought up the variac and checked the capacitor as it formed. And I found that a couple of the sections had zero volts on them. And that's, of course, the capacitor over in this area here. I couldn't really figure out what was going on. And we're talking about, you know, high voltage here. That cathode of the modulator should be, I don't know, around 10, 15 volts. They actually use that voltage on the cathode as bias and as uh, help with the AGC, I believe. So if we look at the voltage, I learned something. It's a push on, push off standby switch. You have no idea if it's off or on. That got me. So with the standby switch off, we look at those terminals and we can see we got 159 volts, zero on the cathode of the modulator, five volts there. 5 volts there. Come off standby. Suddenly we have 273 volts high voltage. We got 8.2 volts on the cathode of the modulator for class A operation. 200 volts here. 143 volts there. So the capacitor has reformed somewhat. Now, we got all kinds of hum. So, and there's not much output, but I would assume that that capacitor isn't good. We have a lot of hum, even though there's these capacitors that have been bootstrapped in. We really are going to have to cut that capacitor out of the circuit and replace. Anyway, as far as this video goes, the radio is starting to show signs of life. The other thing we can do is we can short these two terminals and see if the relay works. That's the TR relay. That's working. Okay, as we finish off this video, let's see if we can get some RF out of it. 
I stuck a couple of crystals in there. We now have uh, two crystals installed. And we have this one, two switch where we can switch between the crystals. Let's just turn this thing on with full power. See what happens. Again, those capacitors probably look like quite a jolt to the rectifiers when you turn this thing on initially. Oh, hisses being heard. Okay, that's good. Uh, some of the features. Uh, let's wiggle the tank. Ah, notice how the noise changes when you adjust the tank. That means they're not using any transmit receive relay. They literally have the RF amplifier hanging off the Pi network that's connected to the transmit output tube, the 2E26. This was pretty common practice uh, for a lot of CBs and six and even two meter rigs in the day. Occasionally you'd see something like this used in HF rigs. Uh, it's pretty common in solid state, you know, single sideband and, and uh, CW rigs to dispose of any antenna switching and just hang the receiver off the transmit output network. Also, I see a spot function. Let's try that. Yeah, try the other crystal. Okay, I'll go for that. Spot function works. Okay, we want to try to get some RF output. So we need to short the uh, transmit. Let's try that. Oh, okay, I see some output on the, the old bird. And not much more than five or six watts. Okay, we have work to do there. This is plenty enough for the second video on the radio. Next time, maybe we'll have some of the capacitors changed out that are critical in the power supply. And we will start an alignment. Try, try to get the receiver and the transmitter both measured.